Okay, so now we're going to hit estrogens. Just like we had a lot of progestogens, we've got a lot of estrogens. Our bodies actually make many different estrogen compounds. Estradiol is the one that is most commonly made in the highest concentration. So when we're talking about physiological effects, we're usually talking about estradiol. So we normally just say estrogen. Estrogen has a very poor bioavailability, PO. So when we take estrogen, say in birth control pills, we're generally not taking estrogen itself. We're usually taking synthetic derivations of it. You may have heard about conjugated estrogens. And really all this means when we say conjugated is that it's a group with slightly different structural modifications. So like I said, the body naturally makes many different estrogens. So in your body right now, you're making conjugated estrogens with estradiol being the main one. Plants can also, soy can also make conjugated estrogens, or you can synthetically in a vat create conjugated estrogens. So all that really means is it's a group of estrogens. It doesn't tell you whether it's naturally derived or whether it's synthetic. We don't have as many synthetic estrogens as we do progestins. The main one that we use is ethanyl estradiol, and that's because it has a really good PO bioavailability compared to estradiol itself. We have a few newer synthetic estrogens that you're not going to see as commonly, mestranol, estradiol valerate, and estrace but almost all contraceptives are still going to be based on ethanol estradiol. We have DHEA, which is just a precursor to estrogen. So if you take that, you're just going to end up making the estrogens your body normally makes. And we have CIRMs, which are selective estrogen receptor modulators, which we'll be talking about in more detail. We have clomiphene, basidoxyphene, riloxyphene, ospemaphene, and used in estrogen-sensitive cancers, tamoxifen. Luckily for us, we have the ephene or ephen in all of these names. And we have estra for all of the estrogen synthetics. When we compared estrogen and progesterone, we talked about how estrogen in many tissues is a growth promoter. And that what that meant was that if you had a cell and had the cell cycle and would normally divide slowly, a growth promoter is going to speed up that cycle and now you're going to get replication much faster and you're going to get more growth of those tissues. We also saw that estrogen is pro-clotting. So these two things are responsible for most of the health risks that we might see with estrogen. So because it's pro-clotting, we're going to have an increased risk for any kind of thrombotic event, thrombotic meaning clots. So you can have increased risk for ischemic strokes, myocardial infarctions, any type of thrombosis or thromboembolism or pulmonary embolism. So these can be very dangerous in people who have high clotting risk. And you'll see that estrogen-based agents are often contraindicated for anyone who's had a stroke or an MI or anything like that. But luckily, just like almost all drugs, is is dose-dependent. So at low doses, you have lower risk, and at high doses, you have higher risk. When we talk about estrogen being a growth promoter, and we talked about how that increases the replication of cells, it's only going to do that in some tissues. So not all tissues in your body have estrogen receptors, and not all of them are going to respond to estrogen with growth. But some really important ones do. Estrogen increases proliferation in ovarian cells, in endometrial or uterine cells, and in breast cells. So that can be a real problem if you have a cancer. Growth of cancers in any of these cells would then increase, and the cancer growth would be faster. These are not carcinogenic, they're not mutagenic, so they don't cause cancer, but they do increase the growth of it. If it's a cancer that has this estrogen effect, then we'd call it like an estrogen-sensitive or E-sensitive cancer. Physiologically, you don't want proliferation all the time, so you're also going to have progesterone having the opposite effect in many of these tissues and suppressing proliferation. So in ovarian cells and endometrial cells, we balance out or oppose the estrogen effects by suppressing proliferation with progesterone. So those main risks of estrogen are going to be pro-clotting risks, so anything that has to do with clotting and growth promotion 
so being a problem with anything that is an estrogen sensitive cancer. So now imagine you're me and you're sitting in the waiting room at the dentist and you're reading some like lifestyle magazine because you're completely bored and you open it up and see this ad says vaginal aging and osphena, FDA approved non-estrogen oral treatment that can relieve moderate to severe painful intercourse due to menopause. So vaginal tissues can become less elastic and less lubricated after menopause. So being able to treat that without increasing estrogen and increasing cancer risks would be amazing. So I get all excited at this brand new drug class And the first thing I do is I pull out my phone and I search the MOA. And this is what I find. This is a selective estrogen receptor modulator or a CIRM, which is an agonist in some tissues and an antagonist in others. And so looking at the mechanisms here, it was an agonist in vaginal tissue, which gives us the effect that they are advertising, but it's also an agonist in endometrial and bone estrogen receptors. It's an antagonist at breast tissue. So I'm looking at this and I'm like, okay, it's an agonist at vaginal tissues. So that's what's giving us our effect. It's an agonist at endometrial tissues. That sounds a little sketchy, but it's an agonist at bone receptors. So that would probably decrease osteoporosis. And it's an antagonist at breast tissue. So that might be kind of good if you wanted to decrease potential breast cancer growth. So when I look at this, the first thing that I think is they are totally scamming us. They said it's a non-estrogen treatment, but really it's acting like estrogen in multiple tissues. It's just not technically estrogen. So that first thing that I worried about was, okay, what's going on in the endometrium then? I would expect an agonist at endometrial tissue to cause increased growth. It also makes me wonder what its effect on clotting is. Is it an agonist or antagonist in the clot pathway? So sitting in the dentist's waiting room, pull up the FDA approved drug information sheet and you see it has a boxed warning. The boxed warning is for potential increase in endometrial cancer and potential increase in cardiovascular disorders. So this is exactly what you might predict to see knowing the MOA for this agent. So now we're gonna talk about CIRMs, and they are pretty complex, but the main thing to remember is every CIRM is an agent that will activate estrogen receptors in some cells and inactivate or act as an antagonist at estrogen receptors in other cells. In cells that don't have estrogen receptors, won't do anything. So we have at least four estrogen receptor modulators right now. We've got clomiphene, which we often use in infertility treatments, bazadoxifene, raloxifene, ospemifene, and tamoxifen, which is used in estrogen-sensitive cancers. Good drug name tip, they all end in phene, so that will help you a bit. Because all of these can be an agonist at some cells and an antagonist at others, to understand what these drugs do, you've got to know which tissues it's having which effects in. Now, luckily with all of these, there's only one tissue that we need to really look at. In the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis, these have mixed effects. So we're not really gonna be looking there. They're all agonists in bone tissue. So all of them are going to decrease osteoporosis. They're all antagonists at breast tissue. So all of them could decrease breast cancer growth and they all are agonists in our favorable lipids and cholesterol pathways. So, so far, those are actually all really good. The place where they differ is in the uterus and endometrial lining. Clomiphene is an antagonist here, as well as bazadoxifene. So we've got two antagonists. Tamoxifen is an agonist in the uterus, and ospemifene and raloxifene are mixed. So even within the uterus, they're going to have some activating, some inactivating effects. So the way you're going to use these and the dangers that you can have are all really going to be mediated by what it's doing here at the endometrium. Choosing between these is more of a specialty. So all I really want you to know here is that if I gave you any of these CIRMs, they're going to increase bone mass, decrease breast cancer, 
decrease cholesterol and promote good lipid ratios. And their effects on the uterus or endometrium are going to be things that you're going to learn later anytime that you are getting more detail about these drugs. But I do want you to know that basic concept that you can't look at these drugs as either only agonists or only antagonists. And that's going to greatly affect the use of each of these drugs.